Hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Talking Time Pieces, where we talk about watch collecting and horology. Um, before I start, I wanted to uh, make a quick uh, shameless plug for my uh, new podcast over at Electronic Design, uh, electronicdesign.com. Um, I'm a uh, host of a new podcast series that they've launched called Inside Electronics, where I talk about uh, items of interest to the electronic design industry, uh, embedded electronic engineering from the designer's point of view. So um, the first episode, I interviewed some people over at Rodian Schwartz about their new eight channel oscilloscope. And uh, I also did a commentary on artificial intelligence. Some other episodes coming up, I'll be talking about cybersecurity and interviewing some other uh, companies doing some interesting things in the embedded electronic space. But back to watches. <clears throat> Today, I wanted to talk about um, design language and how design language applies to uh, watches because one of the aspects of design is beyond functionality, obviously, is creating it with a signature, be it from the designer itself. Some designers are known for their style, um, Gautier or someone like that, or in architecture, uh, Gary or uh, someone like that. Uh, having a design language, having a specific style that people can identify readily helps identify you. It helps people recognize who you are, what you do, what your products are, be it a skyscraper, a car, or a watch, wristwatch check. I'm wearing a um, my, my Breitling uh, Navitimer GMT. And for example, it's kind of easy to see that this is a Navitimer. The, the Navitimer is pushing uh, 70 years old. And um, you could wear one from the 50s and it would be identifiably the same family. And the newest ones also uh, do the same. There are some that have uh, different bezel color combos, but those are very, um, usually special editions. And uh, I mean, there's nothing wrong with that, but the fact that the, the large face, the complex presentation of the, you know, chrono, and then, you know, the slide rule bezel is a hallmark of the Navitimer. So when it comes to, you know, an identifiable style, watches are as beholden to it and as and benefit from it as much as any other product in the industry i mean if you think about it like let's think about cars for example um some car companies shoot for a total uh body identity like porsche you can pretty much tell a porsche at least the sedans uh and uh coupes from the general shape of the headlights the bumper and grill, if there is a grill. Uh, and in the case of, uh, you know, the, the tail end, like the new Panamera, the Panamerica, Panamera, it has a much more 911-ish rear end and is a much much more accepted vehicle for that. Uh, the And also it's a much better looking rear end than the original first generation uh, Panameras, although they were they are really nice cars. And in some cases, the, the uh, design language is confined to something as uh, basic as the grill. You know, um, some cars are identified by their grill shape or the placement of the logo on the hood. Because um, the logo is not necessarily part of the design language of the product. The logo is an identifying aspect. But where that logo goes, how it's displayed, and uh, how it's presented, those are also... Uh, aspects of the design language of a car. You know, you see a Rolls-Royce grill, it's pretty obvious um, what kind of car it is. And uh, Rolls-Royce tend to have a body design language and along the lines of it's going to be big, it's going to be blocky, and it's going to look really comfortable. Um, but for example, Bentley used to be the off-badge uh, brand for Rolls Royce. Um, Rolls Royce, if you were, say, a rich person in a country where they eat rich people, you would buy 
a rolls uh, with the Bentley markings. And so they would take the spirit of ecstasy, which is the name of the statue, off of the car and they would uh, change uh, the uh, badging. And it would be a Bentley, which is, was basically in those days just a Rolls Royce that was rebadged. Um, when BMW and Rolls Royce conspired to screw Volkswagen over, when Volkswagen won the bidding with the British government to buy Rolls Royce, Rolls Royce sold the name Rolls Royce to BMW and sold the company with all of its debt and everything to Volkswagen. But they forgot about Bentley, and so Volkswagen took the Bentley name and resurrected it using the platform, which was the Volkswagen Phaeton, which was a fantastic car, but was a Volkswagen. Talk about, you know, body design language. It looked like a big Passat, and nobody was going to drop six figures on a big Passat, but they would on a Bentley. And the, the first generation uh, Volkswagen Bentleys were essentially... Um, those cars, the Phaetons, with new skin. And uh, it was a supercar. And so the, 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 the Bentleys came out of the gate with fantastic engineering, high performance, 10-cylinder uh, v, V10 engines, V12 engines, I believe. And uh, they managed to, to, to bring that company literally back from the dead because they didn't even have the Rolls-Royce name anymore. So it, it, it design language style, the way that you present yourself to the marketplace is critical when it comes to design, you know, mechanical design at the minimum. Electronic design is a little bit different, but then there the elegance needs to be in um, the user interface. You know, how is that information presented to the user? How can that, in how can that user input information? You know, you can have a touch screen, but then how is the touchscreen laid out? You know, look at a good example of software um, style design language is look at an episode of Star Trek where they're all using touchscreens. They shoot for a very specific font presentation layout style. And you know what a glance that that's a Starfleet computer, even though it's a fictional device. You know, design language is a very powerful language if you know how to use it. And one of my uh, jokes all the time is watches, it's not even a joke, it's an observation. Watches are a language for other watch collectors. You know, um, I'm, I'm far past the point where I'm, I'm, I'm trying to impress people, but I do want to communicate to other collectors about my taste and my style from what I'm wearing. You know, um, a Breitling Navitimer on a rubber strap is, is a nice sporty looking watch. Um, someone who knows watches would recognize, ooh, nice Breitling. Um, someone who would then recognize the advantage of having a GMT dual time zone and all of that other. It's just a nice watch. Um, there are people who wear watches because they want to show wealth or they have a totally different style. Maybe they're wearing something with bright colors or they're wearing something <clears throat> with, um, you know, maybe a solid gold piece with diamonds on it, you know. I am not the judge of other people's style. And that's the thing about style. Everyone develops their own style. And that's manifested in products as well, because those products, in one sense, are characters, right? I just noticed James sent a note. Uh, Hi, all. I think every component, including a bracelet, is a design decision. It might not always be a good decision, but it is still a considered one. This is very true. Um, like, for example, I should have grabbed it out of the case. Uh, um, the Universal Geneve Senna has those plastic uh, link claddings. It's not even solid links to make it look futuristic carbon fiber E. Um, unfortunately, the uh, Senna did not save Universal Geneve back then in the 90s. Um, and I'm really glad that Breitling is going to resurrect that company. Uh, I'm really looking forward to seeing. Uh, and, and Breitling says they're going to take their time. So it'll be a few years. But I'm looking very much forward to seeing uh, what new pieces um, with the Universal Geneve name and how much Breitling will have honored the legacy of Universal Geneve. Antares, good evening. And James as well, by the way. And take the curse off the washing machine. Want to tell someone you're a watch geek, wear almost anything on a NATO. 
boom. <clears throat> that, I, I, I saw a gentleman wearing a Seiko Alpinist on a NATO, and that's, you know that's a watch person because, number one, the Alpinist is a watch for collectors. You know, the, the average person doesn't think about uh, because the Alpinist has got that, you know, the compass, bezel, and all that other. Um, it's, it's not the one that the average person would reach for um, unless they were interested in having a good field watch. And then to put it on a NATO, exactly. Well, I mean, if you think about uh, putting something on, like, I, I have I have my Cartier on a rubber. You know, people know that, <laughs> definitely a watch guy. Or actually, one one of the, I did get a comment from a guy who actually said, I could tell you're a watch guy because I wear my Speedy on a black leather. It's a, it's a Omega factory uh, leather, but... Still, it's the it's it's the black leather strap instead of the metal strap. But I like the black on black, and I can wear this with a suit, and it looks sh it looks sharp in a suit. Trust me. But speaking of design language, the Speedmaster has its own design language as well. The twisted lugs, the um, asymmetrical case, so that the you know the the thicker case on this side provides uh, protection to the crown and the lugs. You know, the Speedmaster is one of those watches that you can also tell from a distance. You know, you can see right off the bat, Breitling, Speedmaster, you know, going back to the Cartier, the Santos, very, very, I mean, that design has been around since 1904. Cartier did it for Santos Dumas, hence the name, you know, and Cartier has wisely maintained that square presentation. It's slightly modified with the bezel in the new ones. I'm not sure if I'm thrilled with that. I actually do prefer the older uh, Cartier design, but it's, definitely identifiable as a Cartier. They have a design language for uh, their, even if you look at their round watches, you can tell it's a Cartier. First off, by the um, sapphire on the end of the crown uh, on most of them. The Roadster has a, a steel end, but then that's a sportier watch, so they probably didn't want the um, gem to be damaged. But uh, things that Cartier does like the script on the face, the, the the way they have the font of the numerals, all of those things all contribute to how people identify a product, you know? <clears throat> uh, Cartier on a rubber will do it too. <laughs> yeah. Well, and also it dresses the watch down because if you didn't follow, you know, what watches are, you just think this on a rubber strap is just a clunky sports watch, you know, um, I have the leather for it. And I also, I don't have the factory metal. I have the factory leather. I have a Milanese that fits it, but on the leather, it's too dressy. And on the Milanese is to me, it's too, um, blingy. I, I, like I said, I, I, I like, I like to be thought of as someone who wears a watch that's interesting, not expensive. I want, I, I, if, if the watch has a, um, jewelry side to it you know then i'll wear it more often with suits i don't wear jewelry jewelry but i mean like for example um zenith chronomaster another watch that has a very strong design language and you can tell because zenith does the overlapping colored uh sub dials and uh in the case of the open heart they put it in the same place every model and on this one i i couldn't go as far as a rubber strap on it i tried it on a nato and it's just too uh, dichotomous. So I, I got a nice blue alligator to dress it to like a casual level. So I can at least wear it, you know, casually. Uh, cause I want, I, I like to wear my watches off 10. And if I can only wear it with a suit, it limited limits, you know, when I can wear it, how I can wear it. That's why I'm really pleased that I managed to get the uh, rubber strap for the uh, JLC, the Polaris, which is another family of watches because if you go to the original uh, alarm uh, watch, the JLC Diver, the same font, the same um, indices, the shape of the indices and the like go all the way across the whole uh, family line of the new Polaris uh, pieces. So again, strong branding, strong style, strong style language, design language to, to create an identity for the piece. Because 
you know, that's why everyone points at uh, some watches as being homages to Rolexes, because a lot of the Rolexes were the first generation of that design, like the Datejust, for example, in that case shape and the presentation of the dial and this, you know, uh, well, Blancpain actually did it first, but um, the, the Submariner's iconic design, it's also an earlier generation design. It's kind of hard to do variations on that design. Um, I uh, had to send off my uh, Rado, for some reason it's not winding, um, sent the Rado back off to uh, Rado because it was under warranty, my Captain Cook chrono, so I don't have it to show. But for example, the Captain Cook came out in the 70s originally, and it went out of its way to not look like a sub. You know, that's why it has the inverted um, bezel, one of the reasons, so that it was trying to not look like an homage to a very famous piece. You know, style is very important. And the more unique you can make your design while still making it appealing, that's those are the keys to the kingdom, right? <laughs> Let's see. Um, Gian, how's it going, Gian? Hello, everybody. Uh, happy, belated Happy New Year. No, Happy New Year to everyone, by the way. I wasn't aware there was a stream on New Year. Yeah, well, you know, it was a Sunday and I I, di I didn't, I was at my daughter's for uh, Christmas, so I didn't do a Christmas show. And I felt bad not doing, you know, two live streams in a row. And the show ended before 11, so, you know, local time. So I it didn't keep me from enjoying uh, New Year, but I actually wound up staying home and throwing some fireworks off the balcony because you can do fireworks in Germany. Oddly enough, they're debating banning them right now, but it's nothing but homemade, I mean, home bought fireworks up and down every street in almost every German town. If you have a good perspective, it actually looks really pretty across the, a, a cityscape. I've seen it like that before. But uh, yeah, so I watched all the local fireworks going off and I threw some firecrackers myself and I called it an evening. But um, I did the live stream on uh, New Year's because, well, I figured why not do a New Year's wrap up on New Year's Eve. The timing was perfect. And uh, I hope you did take a look at some of it and enjoyed it. Let's see, what else do we have here? Uh, James, Seiko's consistent design style is why I identify most with them. Every very, even very different Seiko watches and sub brands all share a common design style. Well, this is also true. But then again, I wouldn't say, I would say that they, that families within Seiko, and they do share some some things, but there are very strong family lines like the Sumo or um, the, the Seiko 5 family of pieces. Um, there, the um, SKX, you know, there, there are certain, the Turtle, you know, there are certain families within Seiko that are also very, very strongly identified, you know, within each other. But yeah, you're right. Seiko has a, a shares quite a bit, um, a lot, well, a lot to do with, you know, fonts and indices and hands and things like that. But those are the things we look at, right? Catch the ZI identifies the piece, you know? Then again, you, you know, that's why it's funny things like, um, this is an homage to, uh, I, it's a cheap homage. I did the episode on it, um, on cheap watch choices, but I kept it because, you know, it, it is cutesy. Um, and of course, Constantine Chaikin does the real ones of these. And uh, not too many people do the eyes. And frankly, since he's done it so well, if someone does do it, they have to do it so differently because otherwise people will think that they're homaging Constantine Chaikin. See, that's the thing. That's the beautiful thing about having a strong design language. If anybody else tries to copy it, people think that they're stealing or at least borrowing or homaging, right? Um, Gian, James, yeah, now you mention it, I was gonna say Hamilton is also, Hamilton, well, their field watches all have a very strong um, military design language, hearkening back to the militaries that they served, you know? Hamilton's got a beautiful history in that sense. Um, James, speaking of straps, a lot of people will disagree, but I think same brand OEM straps usually look better than third-party straps. Well, no, I'll give you that. I'll give you that easily because they were designed with and for the piece. So, for example, um, this rubber strap doesn't look bad on this watch, but if it were tailored to the watch, it would be way better. I mean, like, for example, I had uh, 
a leather strap on this and a, on, on, the, on the Polaris and various others, but I finally got the factory rubber and just it, it fits the case. It, it enhances the look. I'll give it to you a dozen times a day that the factory strap looks better, but why not put it on a NATO sometimes? You know, like I've got my Globemaster right now on a blue rubber. So, you know, to dress it down so I could wear it more casually. I like, to, I like to wear my pieces. And so um, by putting them on NATOs and rubbers, I can take these, you know, watches that a lot of people would think are way too expensive to begin with and wear them in a more casual setting. Although I did, t I did swap out the leather strap for um, the factory mesh metal because it's such a nice, clean, tight mesh on my uh, Junghans uh, chronoscope. Talk about a watch with a design language. You know, the Junghans all have that beautiful domed crystal. And this is what they call Series SC because it has a sapphire crystal. Um, you could order them with a sapphire crystal, but the, this is, the one of, I think, the, one of the few series that actually goes out on the shelf with a sapphire but basically it's just a value 7750 but just very well done and it has a display back but jung hans has a very strong design language if you make a cushion case high domed uh dress watch people think you're snapping on uh jung hans you know or you could have a watch that expresses a design philosophy and by doing that give your brand identification like uh, Nomos, you know, this is as Bauhaus as it gets. I'm, I'm, my joke about is this one is like, it is a watch. It tells time. It is well made. And, and that's it. Although it is party in the back. You look in the back and there's the uh, Deutsche Uhrenwerk in-house Glashütte movement, and then, which is just awesome looking. And so I, that's one of the reasons I like this. And again, I have it on a rubber so I could dress it down a little so I can just wear it more casually because I like to wear my pieces. I must admit I do leave the Rolex on the steel because I, I usually just wear it to my bar where um, the bartender, uh, well, actually the bartender's the owner's son and the owner, they bought pieces from me and they're a little bit on the uh, pretentious side. I wouldn't call them snobs. They just like expensive pieces and they always give me crap when I wear this uh, on a NATO or on a rubber. So I just give it up and I just wear it on the metal. And then that way they don't harass me about it. But um, yeah, I mean, it, uh, <clears throat> straps are also part of the design language. The, 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 the Oyster, the Rolex Oyster bracelet is iconic. The Rolex Jubilee bracelet is iconic. There are very few watch bracelets that are iconic. Um, the Milanese bracelet designs is, is, is a generic. I mean, I wouldn't say generic. It probably fell into the public domain or whatever. Uh, whoever initially designed it didn't bother to patent it, possibly. But um, the, the the band, the strap, it, it is part of the, the watch's uh, design language as well. You know, I mean, this rubber strap, this is the factory rubber strap for this piece. So it actually has you know, embossed letters brightling around it. And it's the factory uh, buckle. So the, I actually ordered this uh, from the Frankfurt uh, Breitling Boutique. They did a good job. The Frankfurt people are nice. Um, and they put it on for me and attached the buckle and all that other good stuff. Uh, so I, if I can, I do try to get the factory um, alternate straps, just like in the case of the leather strap on the Speedmaster, this is the Omega black alligator with the Omega deployant um, buckle. So I'm still all 100% factory on this one, but it's black on black, which I like. And like I said, the leather strap dresses it up so you can wear it with a suit without feeling, you know, um, improper with a metal bracelet. I mean, you, James Bond and all, now you can wear a metal bracelet with a suit, but traditionally you should wear a leather strap with a suit. See, so some style is also part of tradition. <laughs> oh, yep. Hamilton has a consistent and strong design language. James is agreeing with Gian. Um, oh, and also James Omega does sell branded NATO. Some companies do branded NATOs. Um, my Captain Cook came with a branded NATO. Gian, nice to hear you had an awesome time on New Year's. There you go. Hope everybody enjoyed theirs. I agree. 
the taking the curse off the washing machine says, I agree with James. There's something about Seiko design that kind of runs through their entire product line and tells me I'm looking at a Seiko. I would have a hard time explaining it, however. Yeah, exactly. But the thing that's that's part of a that's why it's a design language. It's cues that you're putting into the design to make people recognize what you're doing. Like I was saying, think about a Lancia grill versus a BMW grill. Or um, look, think about the Braun calculator. The Braun calculator was so popular that its keyboard layout and design is still used on some um, web, you know, software-based calculator interfaces. It's such a, it was such an interesting, clean, well laid out calculator. Um, of course, uniforms, or even think about uh, clothing design in a movie. Strong design language in a movie. In the design, in the in costume design, for example, can make or break a p a movie a piece. Uh, like Gautier did the clothes in Fifth Element. He was the clothing designer for the Fifth Element. And you, if you know Gautier, you it shows. You can see the style. He did the pointy Madonna thing. If you don't know who Gautier is, by the way, and I don't. I, I my my uh, first ex wife was very much a fashion is very much a fashion person. Uh, and I kind of picked up some of it by osmosis just by being exposed to so much of it. Um, but that also helped me, you know, with thinking about design and thinking about style because it's all tied together. Although, interestingly enough, the rich don't buy luxury clothing. They don't buy Gucci sneakers and all, but they will buy a nice watch. Um, well, Gates famously wears a Casio Duro. Uh, but uh, he's often seen with his friend, um, well, several of his friends who are stockbrokers uh, who are wearing Rolex presidents and the like. So, you know, to each their own taste. I wish I could swing a, a president. That's a nice piece. Although the trouble is I'm not a big yellow gold person, so I'd have to get a white gold or a platinum, and that would make it even worse for my fictitious budget. Let's see. Um, Yorick, did you hear about Balton's homage to the VC America? And yes, it's a stunner for the price, even in macro shots. Well, and that's, see, that's a perfect example of, you know, homages versus fakes. That's a beautiful homage. And Balton's stands behind it. If it breaks, you send it to them, they'll fix it. They put their care into it because their name is on it. Um, I think it's a really beautiful presentation. I, I, I like the driver's style, although I'm leaning towards a Longines Avignon chrono, mono pusher chrono. They have that's that's an angled display too. I'm 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 just girding my loins because that's like a five thousand dollar watch. And the Baltany is very attractive at its price point. <laughs> it because you, you get you get that beautiful design, that nice style in a, a lower significantly lower price but see and that's that's the thing again uh, an homage is borrowing that design language from that uh more famous or the, in that case the specific style the specific design of that um watch you know and it's in one sense it's great because the two wearers are rarely going to meet you know what I mean? You're not you're, you're not going to wear the the ball the, the 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 person wearing the American. Well, you never know who shows up in bars. But you know what I'm saying? It's not it's not like the friends of the guy who bought the Baltany or gal are going to say, "Oh, you bought the Baltany." They're going to say, "Oh, cool watch," because the people you know a, a, the first criteria of a watch is should look good on your wrist, and the price is a secondary issue. So you know, wearing something that looks that nice. They're going to get compliments on the piece. And the average person doesn't care how much a watch costs. They really don't. So if you have a nice looking piece, you're ahead of the game. But I, I Yorick, yeah, cool one. Oh, by the way, hello. I didn't know if I said hello to everyone. And hello, everybody who is uh, even watching at this moment or will watch in the future. I always uh, like to greet everybody uh, because, as I've said many, many times, I would be you know, just some guy rambling in his room by himself. If it weren't for you all, if it's, the, if it weren't for the community that we're building, we broke 4,000 subscribers in December. So we're doing, we're doing pretty good. We're doing pretty good. Thank you. 
So let's see. Gian, question. Regarding dive watches, do you prefer the Blancpain-esque design or the Rolex Submariner-esque design? Um, I must admit I like the Rolex Submariner-esque design. I like a sportier-looking dive watch. The Blancpain, even though ironically it is based on a military design, it strikes me as a more elegant watch. And um, although if you get this, if you get the uh, sapphire bezel model, that's I would I actually you know what I would go with the sapphire bezel, the blunt because I was thinking more of the slim bezel, uh, fifty fathoms, but I think that's more like the bathyscaphe. Um Yeah, I would I would if if I had if I had the cash, I would get I would get the uh, sapphire crystal uh, fifty fathoms. I would because. Um, it's a beautiful watch, well made, and the nice thing about it is uh, the average person won't know that it costs more than a Rolex. You know, that's the nice thing about having a well made enthusiast piece. Enthusiasts, you know, fellow watch collectors know what you're wearing, but the average person, the one who's impressed by the fake Rolex, the average person doesn't know you're carrying, you know, twenty k on your wrist, and so you can breathe more easily because. You, you, you're not worried about some jerk, you know, smacking you across the back of the head with a stick just because they, you know, want what you have. Um, I'm not saying you should not buy. I mean, I have a Air King myself. But then again, one of the reasons I like the Air King is not immediately identifiable as a Rolex to the average person. I mean, if you, you know, think about the case and the bracelet and all, of course, it's a Rolex. But the average person is so used to seeing, you know, the sub or the date just um, and maybe the Explorer, that uh, to them, a, a, a watch as um, brash as the Air King doesn't fit into, you know, into their mindset about what a Rolex should look like. So that's, like, that's what I was saying. I like, I like having the low-key, nice piece. And that Blancpain is a low-key, nice piece. Um, the quality is impeccable. It's, and it really is a nice piece. I mean, sapphire bezel. Oh, James, speaking of design, I just acquired a Seiko SC8. SC, I'm sorry, SCBS015. It is. It looks unlike any Seiko while still looking very Seiko. Well, very cool on that um, purchase. Again, yeah, you know, there's a, there's a language to how they make watches. And it shows in all of them it, it, and um, especially if you collect a lot of them then you get very familiar with the nuance the subtle differences and then you see them everywhere once you're sensitized Jian, thank you for the congratulations okay um Jean, i was thinking certina has dive watches that look like blanc pond the ph 200 and the 500 and looking like the submariner the ds action diver so i want to hear my thoughts well yeah at that point um although the ds action diver is a nice watch in that case i would go with the action diver i because the action diver is not a rolex homage but it's rolex Rolex esque, you know what I mean? It 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 it, ha, it is a Certina piece, but um, but then again, yeah, I would say yeah, I would say I would say go with because the Action Diver is is got a really nice following as well. Um, it has its own again, it has its own identity. But then again, the 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 others are nice too. I would go try them on your wrist. I would go find a place that offers them for sale. You could probably look, you know, online and find local dealers or local stores that might, or hopefully not too far away where you would actually be able to put it on your wrist. And I would, I would go with what looks best on your wrist, frankly, you know, we'll see it in the steel. And that would really help you with the decision. Cause the trouble is, is that maybe the one that's the Blanc Punk S stands a little too tall and looks a little too big on your wrist, or maybe not big enough for, um, the action diver maybe has a little bit uh, more of a, you know, slope presentation could look different on your wrist. So I would, I would, I would, 
my knee jerk answer would be if you're going if you're not talking about a blanc pond or a rolex i would go with the more mainstream looking action diver but that's my knee jerk but i would i would your your mileage may vary Let's see um james speaking of design oh you i saw that one already uh Gian, yeah, I think there are two major diver styles, the vintage or heritage style versus the modern style, the latter established by the sub. Exactly, exactly. So, let's see. Oh, um, I do want to give a shout out to, I made a note here, Ivan Miranda has a, a website where he does all kinds of engineering stuff, and he did a marble, a clock that uses marbles, drop through shoots to display the time. You have to really check it out. Ivan, I-V-A-N, Miranda, M-I-R-A-N-D-A, um, marble clock. But when I first saw the title, I thought it was maybe a clock made out of marble, but no, it's a clock that actually uses uh, marbles to sp literally spell out the time. You have to see it to to, to, to believe it. It's uh, it definitely worth taking a look. Um, let's see. So, um, as I've said many times, once I've said my piece, <coughs> unless there are some other questions. Oh, G and saying just whacking me describing it. Oh, you probably looked it up. Yep, there we go. York says the clock is massive. Oh, it is massive. Well, think about it. Marbles. And it spells it out. It's really cool. So, oh, wow, that clock is massive. Yes, it is. So what I was about to say is, um, you know, uh, we've been going on for about a half an hour or so, and I've said my piece. So uh, unless there are some questions, I'm going to go ahead and call it a day. Unless, But uh, if there is something, um, we'll stay on a little bit longer. Oh, yeah, see, G, I knew GM might would come in one last question. Um, between unidirectional and bidirectional movements, is that a, or powermatic bidirectional? Oh, you mean as far as the winding? I must admit, um, I do not know. I'll take, let's take a quick look, see. Powermatic, powermatic, oops, thick thumb syndrome. Powermatic winding, no, powermatic 80 winding. Oh, see, they actually had it. They actually had it in the uh, direction, powermatic winding direction. It's online. You can you can check it there. I don't know off the top of my head, and I don't want to take too much time uh, scrolling around on the internet for uh, while I'm on the live stream. But yeah, you can find it. Um, James, I think all Eta movements outside of the Valjus are bidirectional, right? The the Val the, the Valjus seventy seven fifty is a unidirectional, but they probably are more modern movements are bidirectional, I think, but I don't know. So I'm not going to say, um, but I, 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 trust James. He's really good with this. Uh, Yorick, any leather strap suggestions for a salmon dial watch? I want to try blue, red, or green, but I'm sure if they'll match, um, salmon dial, I would look at a color wheel. I think you can get away with blue depends on the shade of blue. You could definitely get away with red, but it might look like too much red. Green, I yeah, I would have to see the shade of green. That that's, but I like where you're going with it. Um, then again, you can always go with black or gray. A light gray strap might you know really help the the salmon pop. You know, think about something like that. Light gray um, or black, but black is. Black is uh, probably the easy way out. So I would I would try a gray, and definitely um, depends on the shade of blue. Let's see, um, James is in counting the manual wine movements. This is a good point, my friend. Uh, yeah, it depends on the shade. James at York, I would put a salmon dial on black so the strap does not outshine the dial. Yeah, see, see exactly. Great minds think alike. Um, Yorick, a suede gray strap would look great, I think. Well, I think gray. I think gray would look good. And interesting, yeah, suede gray. That would be an interesting thing because um, 
it would definitely be a softer presentation than the, than a shiny alligator or a, a buff leather. But yeah, I you know go to a, go to a shop that has some gray straps, play with them, you know. And you don't have to have the specific salmon watch. You can pick up some inexpensive um, salmon colored watch just to play with it. If you have the watch already, then take the watch with you uh, and play with it on some straps. I've, I've always been a hand on hands on watch person. You know, if you, if you can play with the watch, hold on to it. You know, way 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 better to make a decision really gives you an opportunity to think about it because you're you're using all of your senses. So let's see. Uh, Yorick, um, Suede Gray. Gian says, the only salmon dial I know is the Tissot uh, 1938 Heritage. The gray does seem fitting to it. Well, um, there have been a lot of really nice salmons out there. I think Breitling's got a salmon out as well. Uh, there's some really nice pieces out there right now with salmon dials i think salmon has always been out there i would so i wouldn't really say it's making a comeback but we had a good year last year for salmon dial watches we really did Let's see oh hector hi hector with design language you opt for the new blue dial santos or the new tank francaise well the tank is a slimmer piece so to me i would go with the Santos, because I like um, the chunkier presentation of the Santos. Um, I don't know if you noticed. I mean, you might have dialed in later. I mean, I but I have a I have the uh, XL Chrono myself. I like I, I I like the heritage of the Santos. I like the design. The heritage of the tank isn't bad either, but to me, the tank is a suit watch, um, and the Santos is a sports watch. That would be my, def, you know, defining between, line between the two. And I, I, I lean towards sport watches. I have a few suit watches, but um, I'm always trying to dress them down so I can wear them more often. Um, but yeah, uh, I would go with the Santos. But the tank is a beautiful piece too. Let's see. Uh, What's the history of the salmon dial? It looks vintage and fancy. I think it's just a color um, that was used in. I'd have. I mean, that's another. That would be another good Google search. Um, but uh, sa the, the salmon dials have been around, like I said, as you noticed, a while. Um, and there is something posh about a salmon dial because it's doesn't really match anything, but in one sense, it matches everything. You know, um, salmon as a color kind of transcends the color palette in an interesting way, you know, like having a salmon colored watch. Um, it's, it, 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 it's an interesting way to highlight the piece. Let's put it that way. Um, let's see. Oh, yeah, we, we managed to burn through another 10 minutes or so that way. It was a very cool little uh, series of interviews. See, that's the thing. The show is 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 not anywhere as interesting as it uh, is without you. Um, I can't make, you know, the, 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 the interactions that we have are what really make the live stream worthwhile. Because, like I said, once I say my piece, um, if we're not interacting, there's really not much, you know, to do. And I would hate to waste your time as well. But as long as we're interacting, as long as we're interacting, um, we're all having a great time. So um, don't see anything else. So I think I am going to take it uh, off a little early today. You all have a wonderful week. Oh, thanks, Gene. Um, I did have a wonderful week. I hope you guys have a wonderful week next week. And I'll see you all on Sunday. Love you. Take care. Be safe. And uh, yeah, have a great day.